So hello, everyone. Uh, we at SIRI strive to help the Indian diaspora in STEM research transition back to India. The blogs team at SIRI does so by bringing you some accounts of researchers who recently transitioned back to India in our new faculty perspective series. The Spotlight series focuses on people who transitioned back to India after their PhD to pursue some unique career options outside of academia. Our Evolving Trends in India series takes an in-depth look at, uh, as the name suggests, some of the emerging trends in the Indian research ecosystem. However, after transitioning back to India, getting yourself established in a particular research field, uh, that's not an easy task. So it is, it is possible that you even might be one of the few people working in a new cutting edge research field in India. So in here, uh, some words of experience can be very helpful from people who have already transitioned back to India a long time ago and established themselves uh, in the field. Learning from the challenges that they faced, the unique, experience, unique experiences that they had uh, will help all of us. Their outlook on the future and their advice to young researchers will also be very important. Keeping all this in mind, the Sairoi Blocks team has started a series called Forerunners to share the experiences of established researchers in India. As part of this Forerunner series, we have with us today Professor Rohini Godbole. She is a professor in professor Center for in High Center. Energy Physics, Indian Institute, in Indian Institute of Sciences, Bangalore. Professor Godbole has been working in the field of particle physics uh, for, for over four decades. Her research is focused on the standard model and beyond standard model phenomenology. She has made significant contributions through her work on S-particles and supersymmetry theory, having published many art research articles as well as a book on the subject as well. Uh, she has also worked on theoretical models for new particle production and devising strategies for their detection at high energy colliders. She is a part of the International Detector Advisory Group for the International Linear Collider at CERN. She is also a recipient of many national and international awards besides being the fellow of all the three premier science academies in India, namely Indian Academy of Sciences, Indian National Science Academy, and the National Academy of Sciences. She is also an elected fellow of the Science Academy of the Developing World. She was bestowed with the Padma Shri Award in the year 2019. So it is our great pleasure and honor to welcome Professor Godbole. So Professor Godbole, um, Hello. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to start uh, uh, with the first question that I had to know how did your science journey actually start? Uh, you did your undergrad in uh, science in uh, SP College Pune. And then uh, after that, how did you develop your research in uh, particle physics specifically? Okay. No, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, a no, natural question also. But actually, I would like to go back before I even went to SP College, because I want to send a give a message which I think is, uh, you know, unusual here. See, because I went to an all girls school and I studied in a vernacular medium that is Marathi, which was perhaps not so common even at that time in the sense that people tended to study in English medium schools and among my contemporaries in the US when I went to the US. There were very few of us who had studied. There were a few who had studied in the mother tongue. But actually what was even more interesting is that in this all-girls school, till the seventh grade the class, we were not taught any science. We were taught uh, what is called home science. And very little of actual natural sciences was taught. And uh, so in that sense, uh, if you ask me, up to the, uh, straight up to the 11th grade, uh, I, was, I was a sort of a, so to say, a bright student, you know, taking part, but, you know, sort of more traditional debates, essay writings, you know, who, who was my most favorite poetess, uh, Marathi poetess, or who was the most favorite poet, or, uh, you know, this was the time when India got, uh, you know, organized on linguistic grounds. So whether there should be linguistic uh, states uh, based on ling language or not. You know, these are the kinds of things I debated. I wrote essays. I wrote poetry. And now when I look back, I think the experiences I got in that is something that actually has helped me in my research uh, career because these were the experiences of researching into something. It doesn't have to be science. 
it was the experience of trying to logically present your thoughts to the outsiders. So, you know, to be honest, till my, you know, 11th grade, I don't think I took part in any science uh, fair or made any science uh, exhibits. So it was a very funny kind of uh, situation. But I want to say that that too can actually form a very important part of a scientist's toolkits. So we should not, I mean, this is not directed at you guys, but directed in the broader sense. So I thought I should uh, say this. But mm -hmm. I was lucky because what happened was in the seventh in grade, the seventh there used to be a state uh, scholarship examination. These are now gone, but this used to be, you know, some 40, 50, 60,000 60, students, students, I guess, I guess, I guess. I guess. all over Maharashtra. And they used to give 10 scholarships, 10 or 20. And actually, believe me, those days, only people in uh, Pune, Nagpur and Mumbai perhaps uh, got them because if it's 10 or 20 out of whole of Maharashtra. And then nobody before me in my school had got it. And for the simple reason, because there was one whole paper in science and nobody had studied science. So, I mean, how do you expect to be able to get it? So, my teachers actually took extra time. And that teacher in the seventh grade who taught me or began teaching me science is my introduction to science. So, for your question as to how did I do particle physics, I want to say before that, I want to tell you how did I do get into science. Otherwise, yours truly would have been... Actually, I was thinking till the 11th grade that I was going to do my PhD in Sanskrit or in uh, mathematics. And then by the time I reached 11th grade, I thought that, you know, doing mathematics is perhaps too difficult to get a job. I thought, you know, 16, 17 years old, I thought that, you know, getting a job in mathematics is a bit difficult. So I decided that if I want to do, maybe I should do physics. So <laughs> this is a, so to say, a very ill-informed, but I think in the end of the day, I ended up doing theoretical physics, which is as close to mathematics as it, as it gets. But as I will describe to you later, my work is also very closely related with experiments uh, results. So therefore, actually, I think my shift was what my gut told me. So that is the one part also I wanted to share with you. And I think the second thing that really played an important role in my today being a scientist is there used to be a scholarship called scheme called National Science Talent Search Scholarship, NSTS, which is a different form than what now you have talent search, okay? And there used to be 350, maybe 400 scholarships all over India. So it was a pretty choosy thing. And this was in the 1960s, right? 64, it started, I think, in Delhi in 1960 or 62. And this was the scheme for government of India to encourage young students to do pure science. So the idea was that you will get the scholarship only if you didn't become doctor or engineer. Okay. And I never wanted to become a doctor or an engineer. I mean, God knows why, but uh, that was never, as I told you, I always thought that I will do a PhD. In fact, when I was in SSC, that is the 11th, I was in the merit list somewhere. So when you are in the merit list, people come and interview you. And I, in the merit list, I was the only one at that time who had said that I want to go and do an MSc. And then people, so the reporters asked me, you don't want to become a doctor or an engineer? I said, no, I don't want to do it. So for me, this scholarship was absolutely one of the best things. And what happened in this scholarship? Not so much. We used to have summer school. Okay. And I think for the scholarship, to get the scholarship, for the first time, I did an independent experiment. An experiment which was not given in our uh, lab uh, mm -hmm. done, but something, it was a very small thing, but it was something that I did as far as I was concerned for the first time and which was not listed in the syllabus. So I mean, you can say that this means very poor preparation for a science career, but to me, that was the beginning. And this was when I was maybe, you know, this was 69. So I was 17 years uh, old and not yet. My, and then in the, you know, three years of my BSc, we attended the summer schools. And actually the fact, the, the thing that I am in science today, I owe it to the interaction with my classmates in that summer school. They came from all over India. So that was the first time I got exposed to the you know, things that were beyond my little world in Pune, which was a very good town, which was a very, you know, a town which is sort of in Marathi, it's called Vidyatse Mahirgar. The, you know, so it's really a house, 
house of uh, education. So I, I studied, I lived in a good city. I studied in a good college, but still the broader perspective, the more global perspective I got in these summer schools with my co-students. And that is where, you know, I first realized that, yes, you can go outside India to do a PhD. Yes, you don't need, I mean, frankly, in the words of a very good friend of mine, you people are far better informed. We were more like gadhas. We had no knowledge. I didn't even know a comparative study of, you know, whether India Institute of Science is a better place to do PhD than Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Frankly, we hadn't gone up to that stage to study. But on the other hand, because of this broader student participation, and also because for my MSc, I went to Indian, uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Mumbai. And again, this broader interaction, global thing continued. And that is where now I come to the answer to your specific question, why I decided to do particle physics. That is where it lies. Because in our MSc days, there was very, you know, I, I owe a debt of, uh, you know, debt to him, Professor S.H. Patil, who I found... Was, he was a young teacher who had joined, I think, IIT in 72 or 671, and we joined uh, IIT in 74. So, you know, it was uh, just he was also a enthusiastic, and he, he was always a great teacher, and he was a theoretical physicist. So I think he exposed our minds, at least my mind, to the beauty of theoretical physics. And if you were going to do theoretical physics, believe me, in 1974, Nuclear physics and particle physics were the top of the list. I mean, those were the happening areas. So if you were ambitious intellectually, which I think, you know, having gone to IIT, having been a medal holder in BSc and then in MSc, I was. He said, yes, this is what I want to do. So it was, and of course, this was not just romanticizing. He, he made us see the beauty through the coursework, through the and assignments. I did my term paper with him, which gave me the first glimpse of what research, theoretical research can be. So that was my, I would say, and it got me hooked. I mean, simultaneously, you know, uh, books like uh, the Brighter Than Thousand Suns or books like uh, very various sort of popular books by very celebrated scientists, things like first three minutes these kinds of books by, by which was by Steven Weinberg these books did already talked of things to come that what is this vast expanse that theoretical physics is all about so I think this is the beginning of sort of an adventure that I would mm -hmm. say uh, it has not yet ended so mm -hmm. that's all I okay. can say Okay. Uh, yeah, before Kadambri asked the next question, I had a just very quick follow-up on a side note. You mentioned that uh, 70s was uh, like when it when you thought of theoretical physics, it would be uh, particle physics or nuclear physics. Uh, but that was also a golden period for uh, astrophysics as well, right? 60s, 70s. Uh, uh, actually, compared to astrophysics, I think at that time, particle physics was perhaps had an edge as I see. far as... As a, I'll tell you why. Because this is a very rich period for astrophysics and astronomy for beginning of very uh, good measurements. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, unless you had the concept of the bigger picture that people wanted to evolve to connect these measurements to some theoretical uh, connections, I think at that time, those developments were few and far between. I mean, okay. look at it this way. Even the dark matter research that uh, Vera Ribbin did was 1974. Mm -hmm. So the astrophysics astronomy was of course interesting, but I think it's far more interesting today when the okay. measurements have become far more accurate uh -huh. and the theoretical developments have been far, uh, you know, I, I think I speak from a point of view of a theory, particle physicist perhaps, because classical astrophysics has been developing, I mean, that has been the propelling uh, uh, that has been propelling our developments in classical theoretical uh, sciences and physics etc mm -hmm. but i think it was at that point in terms to for a young mind 
to think that this is where things are going to move, it was political crisis. Okay. I mean, that is the... See, because this is the time when you are just about understood that there are quarks inside a proton. Right. So you can imagine the mm -hmm. excitement at, since you know from quarks to the rest of the particle physics has been the journey of last 50 years. So it was really the golden period, I would say, of mm. particle physics. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's it's honestly inspiring to hear about your clarity of thought at the age of 16 and 17 to do a PhD and to actually make your way there, like from not learning science in school to uh, learning it voluntarily and actually actualizing it and moving so much further in a career in physics. But what actually uh, pushed you to choose Stony, uh, Sunnybrook, Stony Brook for your uh, PhD? Okay. Was it your summer school? Or... That's a good question. And again, I will tell you the same thing. Okay, in the case of, I mean, this is again an extremely accidental thing. Okay, what happened was that slowly because in IIT, I began to realize that maybe I should I should think of going outside India for a PhD because at that time, it, you know, the modes of communication between the West and India were not so mm. uh, fast. I mean, the only way you got access to the current literature was when the physical review D or physics physical review letters came by AML. So only if the institute was rich enough to afford physical review letters to come by AML. I mean, this mm -hmm. was an India in 1972, which was a very reasonably poor India. So I think already it was clear that if you want to be in the hub of scientific activities, perhaps going abroad would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And at that time, I think England, uh, the UK and the US were the only two realistic possibilities for Indians. Uh, because and U U.S. even better because there were a lot of scholarships. Mm. Uh, because you see, I came from a very, I mean, I I think these days it's the definition has changed. But what we would call a middle class family, that means a family which values education, which has reasonably you no, know, which has income enough to live in, uh, you know, it's not prosperous living but live in good uh, conditions, but it was not. A family which could say that, okay, I will pay for your education abroad. I mean, that was not even the thought, except among the very rich. Okay. So that was not a possibility compared to today where you take a loan and you say, I will go, I will spend uh, five lakhs a year, uh, get a loan and I will pay it off when I get my degree. So going abroad was a reasonably complex uh, operation. And I started thinking about it rather late in terms of, you know, the preparation you had to do. You had to give a GRE graduate record examination. You had to give test of English as a foreign language TOEFL. I don't know if any more of those are valid, but you had to do this. And you had to get these to even being considered for admission. So you had to submit these course already along with your application form. And then even for the pre-app forms, you had to send $2, $5, so that you would get, you know, so you ask for a pre-app form, you pay money for that. Mm. And it was all a complex procedure. I was not sure whether I wanted to get into it. So forget about Stony Brook. I was not even sure whether I would be able to also monetarily afford doing the whole complex uh, application process. But uh, as it happened, uh, there was actually a scholarship by announced by I think it was AAAU American Association of University Women or something like that okay AAUW I think American Association of University Women and uh, AAAS which is now American Association for Advancement of Sciences so together they had announced I think again some five to ten scholarships for women from outside India outside the US to come and do PhD in the US and then the condition was that you had to get an admission to one of the U.S. universities. And this came in November, October. And mind you, by this time, I had not even thought, right? So my mother somehow found out about this application from somewhere. She was a great one. So she went and got that application form. And I was in IIT at that time. 
I came home for the weekend. She showed, showed it to me. So I said, okay, then at least even if I don't have admission, I should show where I have applied. So then I said, oh, must I must look at it in state universities. Then I chose only five universities, maybe five or six universities because they had no requirement for pre-app forms and they had no application. So I said, okay, this is something I can afford. Because mind you, even to pay the application fee to get the 10 or $10, even if it's $10, which was at that time, I think uh, 80, 50 rupees or maybe 100 rupees. I don't remember something of that order. It was still a fair fraction because my scholarship used to be 250 rupees a month. This is just to give you a uh, sense, okay? And my father's salary was 1250 rupees a month or 1750 rupees a month. Some such ballpark, okay? So I chose only those universities where I didn't have to pay application fee for the form and which had no pre-app forms. So there were five or six universities where, and of course I talked with my professor Patil and said, you know, which are the places which are doing good high energy physics. So I applied to MIT. I applied to, I think, Berkeley. I applied to Rochester because there used to be a very thriving Indian uh, scientist, a very important scientist. Indian scientists, like uh, even people like uh, uh, Sudarshan actually spent some time, ECG Sudarshan, a very famous theoretical physicist, had spent time there. Then I think University of Syracuse and University of Stony Brook. These were the only five places, and may, I, MIT, six places I applied. And believe it or not, I got admission in four of them, but varying degree of support. MIT said, yes, we will pay you uh, uh, assistantship. We will, uh, but you know, only for, uh, uh, we will pay you full assistantship for the first uh, year, but then we will review your case. And I said, well, yeah, you review my case. And if you tell me after one year that I can't get assistantship, I'm not going to be able to continue. So finally, and Rochester and Stony Brook came through completely saying that we, we admit you without any the uh, strings attached. The mm -hmm. all the other two places said we will offer you, but we will reevaluate. You know, I, I think in 60, 79, 74, perhaps this was acceptable. I mean, they were looking at a student from IIT Bombay. They had just started having few experiences of students trained in India, but IIT Stony Brook had actually a very famous uh, student from IIT Bombay who was doing very well there and. So I think they had a very good experience of Stony Brook student. So for, because of that, and then between Rochester and Stony Brook, Stony Brook had one Nobel laureate already in particle physics, that was C. N. Yang, and one future Nobel laureate, almost, unfortunately, he died too early, Benjamin D. So that decided that this is a place for me. I want to do particle physics. These are the people who are, you know, at the forefront so yes, I will go to Stony Brook. So, so as you can see, it's accident, but then directed efforts. So I never got that AAUW scholarship, by the way, because oh. I hadn't got the <laughs> admission back by then. But I got uh, fellowship. And it was important to have that fellowship because even to go to US, the ticket was 5,000 5, rupees, okay? But I had to take a loan, a student loan, to be able to travel, you know, and my parents somehow raised money enough to buy clothes and, you know, send my books by post to US, you know, I mean, you didn't have, have a conception, you know, the books are very expensive in the US, so please take all your books. So one whole suitcase full of uh, books that one is used to were sent by C-mail, you know, two months or three months before so that they reach in good time that uh, when one is there. So it was a strange world. But that's how it went. Okay. okay. Yeah. So no, no Amazon for delivering books or anything like that. <laughs> but at that time, yeah. So yeah, and uh, Stony Brook is, uh, I mean, it's one of the best places to do particle mm -hmm. physics, uh, uh, even now. So uh, yes, that's true. It had yeah. it remains that way. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. So but what uh, I wanted to tell you is mm -hmm. that sometimes totally non-scientific reasons also affect your choice. In the sense right. that MIT, yeah. in some sense, would have been perhaps the better choice had MIT right. not uh, uh, added this clause that you come for first year and then we will decide. But in mm -hmm. the end of the day, if you ask me, I found that Stony Brook finally, when I look at it, 
Tony Brook was actually the better choice for the development of particle physics because I got into the thick of particle physics uh, developmental areas at that time. Whereas in MIT, I might have been more involved with uh, high energy nuclear physics. Nothing wrong in it, but mm. just uh, choices which you make for completely different reasons then decide what you do. Right. So now coming, so moving forward with the particle physics, uh, uh, which is a big part of your research. Essentially, that's a big part of your life. Uh, so uh, can you tell us or uh, even more importantly for people who do not have a, uh, a strong physics background, uh, can you tell us what this field is all about and what do you exactly work on? I ex explained a bit in the introduction, but people may not have understood it. Okay. And especially how, uh, like how it would impact directly to the people's lives. Why should they care about it? Okay, good, good point. So let me try to give you. I actually because here I can uh, get uh, very easily get lost in the number of things I would want to say. I actually did something. I actually put out a few points so that I will be short. Okay. But in some sense, to begin with, for somebody who doesn't know anything about a subject, and I would really say particle physics is, in fact, the subject of how, you know, what are the bricks and the mortars of the universe? Let's, you know, put it sort of very simply that there is this gigantic sculpture that the universe is. And what what is the most fundamental unit of which everything around us is made up of? And it's not just enough to know that, you know, there are uh, rubber balls with which things are made up of. You need to know how those rubber balls are glued together. So how did this Lego picture of the universe evolve? So what are the Lego pieces? And particle physics is all about looking at the full picture where you don't have enough resolution to see the individual Lego pieces. And you need to figure out from experimentation and combination of theoretical uh, constructs and experiments to figure out what are the sizes of different Lego pieces and what are the bars that connect different Lego pieces and how this hole fits exactly, that stick fits exactly in that hole. So that is a very simplistic description of particle physics that it is a dis uh, dis study of what are the fundamental building blocks of everything in the universe and how they are put together. And what is meant by put together is that how do they talk to each other? How do they know each other's presence? And those are the four fundamental forces. So the particle physics is the study of the fundamental part, the constituents of the universe and the fundamental forces among those constituents. And the beauty of last 20th century, I would say, is that we know that those fundamental forces are also caused by exchanging some fundamental particles among the constituents. So those guys are not among the constituents of fundamental part of, the, of our universe, but they're essential for holding the universe together. So that's what particle physics is all about. So in that sense, it's a grand story. And what is amazing and what we have learned in the last century is that the laws, maybe before I, I step back a second, these laws were found beginning from Becquerel's study of radioactivity or observation of radioactivity. Today, in the experiments at the large particle colliders, where high energy particles like electrons, positrons, protons collide, hit against each other, big bunch, millions of particles in one bunch, millions of particles in another bunch, they hit each other and particle physicists do experiments to build giant detectors. And then theorists like me work with them to interpret and understand what these experiments are telling you about. And this mm -hmm. is a very amazing thing because you're colliding things you cannot see. You are seeing in your detectors only parts left by, you know, effects left by charged particles in your detector as it passes through some media. And you are reconstructing the mysteries of the universe. You are reconstructing. And I think that is the game that happened in the last uh, few hundred years. But the beauty is the same laws we find now. And this is where 
work of people like Bethe and Weinberg was very important. We understood that the same laws of nuclear and particle physics apply at the edge of the universe, apply on the sun, and also applied at the beginning of the universe. So this is for a person who doesn't know anything, will realize that therefore these laws and understanding their details is most important. And I have had the luck to work in a subject which you mentioned, standard model of particle physics and beyond standard. Now, I won't tell you the details of my work because I think that is a bit complex to express and share in this small uh, time frame. But at least I hope you get the idea what this is all about. And particularly, I start here by saying that the standard model of particle physics was put forward by Steven Weinberg and as well as Abdus Salam in 1967. And I started my PhD graduate studies in 1974. And in 1974, there was something called November Revolution because a new particle was found about, I don't know how many kilometers away from Stony Brook in the lab in Brookhaven. And I had the pleasure to listen to the talk without understanding much about the discovery of the famous J Psi particle. But that was the beginning of everybody beginning to believe in the standard model of particle physics. And that is where I am a true child of what is called the gauge theories of particle interactions. The era which was spanned by gauge theories, there is a very famous scientist uh, called Tehoft who got a Nobel Prize, Gerard Tehoft. And he wrote a book called Under the Spell of Gauge Principle. So this gauge principle has been considered as one of the overarching principles under which we have understood theoretically and mathematically how we can describe all the fundamental particles and all the interactions among them. In particular, in my life, I have worked on Higgs physics, which we know from 2012, which was discovered and became newspaper headlines. But I started working on it in 1974. I worked on structure of proton. How is a proton made up of? I worked on the physics of the top quark, which was at that time not found, but which is an in ingredient, essential ingredient of standard model. Then very importantly, I worked in a new corner, which people had not yet then seen, which is about a very complex interplay of strong interactions and electromagnetic interactions in the interactions of high energy photons. That is my own niche, uh, as it were, which developed between 1985 to 2000 for 15 year, odd years. Actually, the work I did directed or in, inspired some new experiments, new measurements at uh, different type of colliders. So already the one part of my work description, I'm a collider physicist. So I'm a theoretical physicist who studies the theories of particle physics, but I also work very closely how they can be tested at and how they can be confronted at the colliders. Their predictions can be confronted with data at the colliders. So I interact also very heavily with experimentalists. I need to understand what the experimentalists are doing. And that began from my very first PhD paper. The program I wrote to calculate something that was written in that paper, actually I got a message from my experimental physicist, can we please have your program because we can use it to uh, compare your predictions with our data. So that is where my own work has been. And this work on high energy photons actually ended up uh, impacting uh, possible impact, impact on designs of colliders, which I had not even thought about, but which turned out to be an important point. So this also tells you that in research, your work opens up new directions which you don't even know before about. And perhaps that is the most exciting kind of research where people have not looked at, you know. So, I mean, see, subject like particle physics is a huge subject, but very important subject. So very many important Nobel Prize winners have actually, you know, chartered out big paths, what we can call, you know, uh, big roads. And then small people like us, what can we do? We can only find small uh, excursions from that main road, right? Which have been forgotten. I mean, obviously, when you have Weinbergs and Feynmans and uh, Bethes, you know, winning Nobel Prizes for 
telling you the kind of things that I have told you and discovering them. What can we do? But we can still do something. And I would like to say that that's the proverbial, uh, you know, squirrel's hand that contributes to the development of the subject. So I hope you get an overall picture of the subject and my own contributions to it. And last but not the least, I would like actually to tell people who don't know about particle physics that you may not, you may even think that all this is still esoteric. All this is still, uh, you know, what is called ivory tower uh, science. But you know, because of particle physics, we have today World Wide Web. Because of particle physics, we have internet. Because of particle physics, we have a PET scan. So these are the experimental developments in particle physics or the methods to share information that particle physicists developed. Even the cloud computing, grid computing, these were all the things that particle physicists developed to act, handle their big data and which have now become buzzword changing our lives everywhere. So you, for, you, you decry basic physics at peril to yourself. Because these are the things, we are doing these very esoteric things, but they have produced this very all-pervasive tools to us. And it didn't tell me beforehand, we didn't set out to discover internet. We just said that to exchange data, it's a global science. We had all two inter ex particle physics experimentalists had to exchange information and internet depth. So that's the second part uh, answer to your second part that what does a man or a woman in the street uh, get out of the research in particle physics. That okay. was an answer that every student who wonders why they learn physics really, really needs to learn. <laughs> so okay. you were working on so many uh, no uh, novel uh, discoveries in the field of particle physics. Uh, what was it like moving to India to continue your research? Uh, what were some of the, what was the experience like? What were some of the challenges you faced? How did you overcome them? Can you talk about that? Yeah, again, a long question. I mean, this can be a very long answer and as you must have learned by now, I, a lifetime of teaching has made me, <laughs> taught me to speak at length always, but I'll try to be brief. Hmm. See, Again, coming back to India, at that time, actually, it was pretty uncommon for people to come back to India. I mean, from we in Stony Brook, in my year, we were five students to do who went there to do PhD and in physics, in particle physics, in physics, actually, not just particle physics. There were five of us. And I think four of us, four of them remained in the U.S. and continued and had a very successful life in the U.S. And I came back. Two of them came back for a while, stayed in India for two years and went back. So that was the, and I think there were reasons for that at that time. There were very few avenues for pursuing the kind of abstract research that one wanted to do. In particle physics particularly, I think there were three places. One was uh, uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. One was, of course, uh, a small group, not very big group, but a very influential group in Indian Institute of Science that was Center for Theoretical uh, Studies mm -hmm. and Delhi University and maybe Chandigarh University. So, I mean, it's not filling you and uh, filling one with uh, extreme confidence that there are possibilities for continuing research in this esoteric subject. So then why did I come back? I think uh, it was a combination of uh, having been away for five years in a reasonably, because the gap between the social environment in India and the US at that time was very big. The world was not as global as it is now. Uh, more important than that, I think I missed being a part of the community. I always, because as I, as I explained to you, till my 11th grade, I was very much a part of, you know, society, literary activities, political discussions, discourses. So I wanted to be back somewhere. Some part of me wanted to be back. Some part of me was somewhat tired of staying in a foreign environment. And I was young. So I don't think I thought through very clearly how this is going to impact my research. And I must say that some more mentoring would have been useful at that time. I had a postdoctoral offer in Europe. 
I had a possible offer in US, which had not yet just materialized, but there was every, you know, sort of, if you can wait for three months, we will uh, give you an offer. I mean, after all, they were postdoctoral offers, and these were not offers of uh, any kind of uh, permanent position, but these were long, long postdocs offers. And then there was a postdoctoral offer from India. And I was waiting for the offer from India. So everybody was kind of laughing at me that you must be the only person who is waiting for an offer from India when you have got an offer from somewhere else. But I wanted to come home. So, but I came, luckily, I came to, I would say, the place that was the best at that time, that is in terms of contact with the West, and that is TIFR. Why am I still saying contact was important? Because particle physics has always been a global subject. And there are only few laboratories in the world where the experiments are done. It's not that there is a lab in India, in Delhi University, which is doing an experiment. And if I'm interested in experiments, I can discuss with the experimentalist there. It didn't happen that way. There was only CERN in Geneva. There was Fermilab in, uh, uh, in the US. There was KEK in Japan. And there was uh, DAISY in Germany. And these were like the five, four or five labs. And that's it. So the good part of uh, Tata Institute was there was active, of course, active theory, uh, high energy physics group. Experimental group was also there. So I think the main, main challenge that is access to information was uh, not felt when I was in the Tata Institute. So it was good that I came to the Tata Institute. Uh, but since uh, your Rohit mentioned at the beginning that you may be the lone person with a particular expertise and then you see how to charter your path. So when I came back to India, it was not very common for theoretical physicists to use computers. You know, you would laugh at this because nowadays, you know, theoretical physicists use computers mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. play things. Right? So it was at that time, it was like, you know, if you use computers, Maybe, you know, you were not that smart. You couldn't do things analytically. So that's why you went to computers. And I actually relied very heavily on fancy computational methods. So that was something that this is an a important part of research, a necessary part of particle research at that time. It had not yet seeped through in all the, the people's uh, psyche, who say even among the practicing particle physicists. But in Tata Institute, there were one or two faculty who, one, at least one, who, and as luck would have it, in my first year in Tata Institute, he was not there, he was in sabbatical. So establishing yourself as an expert in a thing which people don't think is essential, it's quite a difficult task to begin with. And mind you, I'm telling you now, I don't think at that time I looked at it and analyzed it so logically. At that time, I was simply thinking, or maybe these people just don't think I'm good enough. See, because just when you have finished your PhD, what is your biggest fear? Can I charter it on my own? Can I ask questions? See, as an independent scientist, whether you are in India or in the US, the important thing is, how do you learn to ask your own questions? And then if these people don't think much of the research I'm doing, maybe I cannot ask the right questions. That's the worry you have. You're worried. You're floundering. And I think at this time, mentoring is very, very important. I mean, that is why I like what you people, exercise you people are doing, that continuing research after a PhD itself is a challenge. And in that coming back to India, at least those days was even more of a challenge because not there was not much money. You couldn't easily travel. There was very little communication with the West, with the newest developments. West in the sense, the developments, not so much the Western science. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, uh, th that was a challenge. But I think part of it was helped by the fact that I worked in one of the top class place in, the, in India at that time. And I think a lot of it was also just being bullheaded about it, big-headed about it. That this is what I want to do. And then how do I create something? Things are not given to you on a platter always. And whether, you know, by, I, I should not say bullheaded, that was a wrong word, pigheaded. Because if you just start creating confrontations, nothing will work. 
you can you have to create your own structures that will help you to do what you want to do so i think what is important and what helped me was to some extent a very clear goal that this is the subject in which i want to work so even if there are not enough facilities i have to try and see how i can go around them rather than changing the subject in which i am working some people did that okay and the matter of fact i owe it to a very close dear friend of mine from my, my masters days i was you know this i was i was not happy i things were not working out when i came back and then he said you know i said maybe i should just go and do plasma physics or something where my computing abilities are well used and people appreciate will appreciate them then he said don't do that particle physics has bit you hard this bug has bit you 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 will regret forever if you give it up so i think that is one line answer to you that it's not that the journey was smooth but one had to be a little bit big headed mm -hmm. okay yeah that's very beautiful advice it's it's very valid advice for all things science i'm definitely going to keep that in mind personally <laughs> yeah no i mean uh, it's true that now uh, in uh, like a lot of facilities have come in india but uh uh it's still very motivating to know how people like you uh uh struggle basically and still you manage to no, uh, i don't want to actually so much talk about the struggle what i want to uh -huh. i should have perhaps added that it was not just by my, my being pig headed it was also the whole lot of people appreciating the desire mm -hmm. and helping me you know mm -hmm. even after i left the tata institute as a post doctoral fellow i joined university there were people who you know my colleagues in tata institute ex colleagues made available the computing system to me because i was collaborating with them mm -hmm. and then okay initially it was oh you are collaborating you can use the computer system but after that i was not collaborating necessarily with them all the time i didn't have a memorandum of understanding between bombay university and uh, tata institute of fundamental research i didn't have any grant with which i paid tifr money for computation so there is this informal maybe it all worked because i was a theoretical physicist i didn't need any lab resources i didn't need to set up a lab so i think it was possible to do my independent research and the resources i needed for that the help i needed for that i got through informal sources and this is what i meant by saying you create your support structures mm -hmm. so and what i want to also i mean this was the message i want to give that yes facilities will increase now for example just exactly at that time internet started coming so tata institute was the first place where internet came in india in fact or maybe iisc was also there and then you know we had to stand in front of a line behind a computer so that for all of us to check our mails but it was much better than writing a letter and writing the draft of the paper in a letter and saying that please give your answer because it would take two weeks here in the internet if i typed it as a mail or sent it as an attachment i got the answer within uh, five days so some facilities started coming communication started increasing and that also helped so i should not say that it is just my pig headedness that helped me but you have to be you have to be creative mm -hmm. if if things don't work right you have to build That's your own that. support structure kind of. yeah yeah you right. have to be creative mm -hmm. you don't mind me I saying you can be creative when you are really driven mm -hmm. Kadamri, no, I said if you don't mind me saying, it's almost the Indian jugard. Yeah. Making sorry, what did you say? I said if you don't mind me saying, it's almost the Indian jugard. Indian? Ah, uh, jugard. Jugard, yes, it is jugard, <laughs> but actually not just Indian. You know, I mean, let me tell you this. Even in the, I think in the world of uh, any anything that you want to do, if you want to do it, I think there are. On, there is only so much that that can come through schemes that can come through policies uh, what really i mean that i think i've already saying what you wanted me to say in the end but what really comes through is that how much you want to answer a question how much the questions you want how much you are affected by the questions you want answered i, I mean i'm not saying that that's enough but that's necessary it's not sufficient there are people who you know so i i completely aware 
that for lack finally you know people who feel so strongly unfortunately may sometimes fall by the wayside you know like but for the grace of god and it is for that that we have to work hard that that does not happen but yes okay. it is finally a little bit of it is some people are lucky they don't need to make, make jugad some people are not so lucky that's about it luck a chance plays a big role i feel <laughs> okay so uh, uh moving a bit away from uh, your uh, research uh, you have done a lot of uh, outreach uh, activities as well and uh, uh, you have written a very famous book called uh, lilavati's uh, daughters uh, which is about uh, uh, essays about uh, women scientists uh, in india so i wanted to ask you about uh, about that book uh, how did you uh come uh, why did you feel the uh, the need for uh, publishing this compiling this and uh, just a follow up for that um uh, we have several schemes for uh, increasing women participation in indian uh, science workforce uh but as of now uh, women make up only 13% of the uh, scientists and faculty position um in higher education and research institutes in india and even fewer in leadership positions so uh could you tell us what do you think are some possible reasons and possible solutions for this and yeah so first the book and then the follow up okay again a long question because just like you said particle physics has formed a big chunk of my life for the last two decades almost from 2000 onwards uh, women in science and women in physics in particular but women in science has been i would say occupied me 10 to 15% of my time very knowingly and i must say that uh, till 2000 i was not very you know i have to give you a little bit of background for lilavati's daughters which is what you wanted i was not very you know i was not, Uh, okay as i i studied in a all girls school then when i went to iit i mean when i was in the summer schools in science talent we were two two or three girls in the class of, in a group of 40 42 in iit we were a three in a group of 17 and that was a big fraction in uh, us we were you know i, I think five or six girls in a graduate class of 40 45 but one was always used to that i mean one at least till i went to the us i didn't even think very much about it except one or two teachers in iit i don't think our even at least i felt the discriminate any discriminating attitude from the teachers towards us that because which is based on gender okay at least i didn't see that my classmates were absolutely fantastic i mean i don't think that uh, we had any to, and i went and checked with my other two girls in my class whether they also whether i am glorifying the past or whether this was indeed the case and they also said that they never felt any difference i mean gender just did not come into part play a role even if we were such in minorities science was an education and other interests hiking this that and other you know it was all literature these were all things we talked about being different gender didn't really matter in school in college in iit i think it's only when i went to the us that i began to realize that people don't take it for granted that women should be doing science but even then i was far too busy in just establishing myself getting my phd coming to a good conclusion you know because phd path of phd is unless you are lucky is not very easy most of the times you fail you know i stumble i mean my case the stumbling was that after one year of spending doing something and giving a talk about it people said aha this is very good this was my actually just the project and they said very good you should write it up as a paper then my supervisor said ah maybe you should go and i went to the uh, library and found a paper with the title that i would have given to my paper published that week so you can have such stumbling blocks and so i was busy with just doing a phd but i think when i came back it's only now when i so till you know i was not really actively ever thinking about does gender affect your scientific progress in your 
uh, path as a scientist. I had not thought about it, I must say. It's only in, in, in 2000, I was asked by the Inter International Union of Pure and Applied Physics, held the first international conference on women in physics. And they had asked the two-day program, three-day program, and there were talks by women physicists from across the world. You know, there was somebody from Brazil, somebody from Egypt, then from China, it was the education minister, a main, male education minister who came to speak. And from India, as a part of the Asian success story, so to say, I was the person who was asked to talk about what does it mean to be a physicist in India. And as luck would have it, I got the chance to talk about it. Because every country had a team of five to six people. And then, you know, the meeting was actually a, the first exposure I had about discussing the gender issues in science. And there was Nancy Hopkins, who was the spear, you know, I don't know how many of you, either either of you know her name. She was from MIT. She was a biologist. And she spearheaded uh, the famous MIT report, which began and, you know, started, propelled the movement for women in science in the U.S. in a big way. So she was one of the speakers. MIT report was fresh, etc. And I think that was the time when I spoke in a session. And I mean, there were very few, maybe 10 or 15 speakers in all. And then, you know, people from Mauritius, Ghana, the groups, or even from places like Greece, then Thailand. You know, these women came to me, talked to me in the sessions between the office sessions. And they said, you know, when all these women from U.S. or U.K. or uh, Europe, you know, there was the CNRS head at that time was a woman. So she was talking, or this Brazilian uh, vice president of Brazilian Physical Society was a woman. She said, they, they were talking. We felt that that was a different world. But you were from among us. You grew up in situations like you, you felt like you were among one of us. And if you can do it, we feel that, yes, we can do it too. And it is then I realized that you need the voice of people, of the next door people who are doing science. So for young girls and women in India who are doing science, they need to hear it from girls and women who grew up in a surrounding which they can identify with. You know, if it is Rosalind Franklin, if it is Madame Mary Curie, if it is, uh, you know, uh, many other, any of them name, any other few, few women, you feel that, yes, you know, these are great women. They are stars in the sky, but they are stars in the sky. I can't reach there. But when you see that your next door person who grew up like you can achieve some measure of success, it may not be a Nobel Prize, but being a scientist doesn't mean Nobel Prize. Every man who does science doesn't win a Nobel Prize. Even in India, very few have won Nobel Prizes even today. So at the point about that doing science doesn't need you to be extraordinary. It requires, it requires intelligence, it requires persistence, but it doesn't require you to be a person out of the box. You just need to think out of the box. And that was my clue to say that let me put together a set of stories which are role models for girls and women, young women who want to do a PhD, who want to not just to do a PhD, but have a life in science. Because doing a PhD, by the way, even in 2000, already 25% of the PhDs in physics in India were women. So it's the path of science as a life. That is important. And that is where we hit upon the idea of Leela with his daughters. And we thought it is best to ask the women themselves. What is it? What helps? What aids? What uh, hinders? And how do you navigate it? And what would you imagine would help even more to increase the tribe? These were the questions we asked them. And these are the essays that I, I'm only the editor. I wrote one essay about my own life, but the remaining essays we only edited uh, for style, but not so much for the content. 
because that was the individual and actually the style is also very different in each. We kept to the original style, but we edited it to sort of match uh, overall. And I think, I do believe that it served a very important purpose. Even though I say so myself. The number of young girls whom we, you know, because Indian Academy published this book to date in 15 years, we have published 12,000 copies. And which is uh, for Indian Academy as a publisher is a big number, in fact, though in general world of publication, it is not too much. And many of the copies have been sold quite often. The Department of Science and Technology actually bought copies from us, left them with us and said, please distribute them. So we distributed them, you know, to various schools, for example, uh, we Josie programs, then summer programs of the academies, we would give them to girls. And we got, you know, various contributors keep on writing to me. They got letters from girls to different contributors. Different stories touch different people's hearts in different ways. And I can tell you one person said, you know, till I read that book, she was a PhD post a PDF in the IISC. She said, I was this close to giving up. But when I read these stories, I said, no, it's not impossible. I can do it. And she continued and today she happens to be a very successful scientist. So I think that is the, and we, we keep on getting these uh, mails even today. It has been translated now in a few languages. But Dilavati's Daughters is just one of the many role model programs, as I call it. We, the need is to have many more, and I don't think we have enough. But now there are these nice new books, 30, I think there is this... Um, I forget her name. The these two people from based in NCBS. The name will come back to me. They wrote thirty adventures, uh, adventures uh, of three thirty young women. So they belong to a different generation, and that's a very nice book which came out recently. So yes, there are progress. You know, these things are happening, and I think Leela Vati's daughters was a bit before its time for the rest of the world, because uh, this was the I found that simultaneously at that time. Because actually in 1995, I'll go back a step below. 1995, there was a famous Beijing Declaration. And that started a lot of uh, uh, effort in women in science, pan world. And that was the IUPAP meeting in 2000 was a direct fallout of that. But in the compared to the West, I think the stories told by practitioners themselves was something that Lilavati's daughters did for the first time. After that, uh, Royal Society actually also brought out a book called uh, Stories of the Mothers or Science, Mothers That Do Science. Or uh, I, I forget the title, but in the latest edition of Lilavati's, we have given the URL of that in the introduction in the preface. So I think that those stories, uh, you know, people like I did, uh, combining lives across nations, combining conducting marriages across distances. Uh, not giving up just, you know, as long as you can uh, and finding a very supportive spouse or the family, the need of that, all that actually came through in these uh, essays. These essays did point out things that are even now not well understood and considered and discussed. This brings me to the next question that Rohit, you asked. It's the that struggles are very often because of obvious causes of uh, uh, hindrances, like balance, balancing career and family, like having children. Do you have? Do you take the choice of not having children so that you can continue in science? That's a very valid. Some pe women in Lilavati's daughter said they never got married because they didn't want to. Uh, they wanted to continue their research. Some women said they didn't have children because they didn't want that to. Uh, and you know disturb their career some women said that they had to work very hard but they got support from the family so the balancing career and balance family etc etc that formed one obvious obstacle but very indirect obstacles which are not obvious but they're very much there about the neglect of your work without realizing the unconscious biases you know Saying what in Marathi we say, saying no with the hand and not with the mouth. That you say, of course I'm giving it to you, but I close my fist so tight that nothing comes to you. 
so that kind of a thing where you are saying no not with your words but with your action you are hindering not with your words but you are hindering with your actions and you perhaps you yourself don't realize that you're hindering it with your actions sometimes it's conscious sometimes it's unconscious and i think that even that bias has come through in the stories if you love these doctors there are women who have and those are more the younger women let me also tell you that there is a analysis if you see the older women actually women even before my generation two generation because we began very early we began from anandi bai joshi who was the first woman uh, uh, doctor to train in the us but otherwise very important uh, women like uh, uh, kamla bai sohani or uh, you know people like that or kamal randive uh, janaki amar and among all these stories there were the, not there were not so much discussion of this unconscious bias because it was a bit like i said that when i was trying to do my msc do my phd i was so focused on doing what i'm doing i was not thinking of this issue whereas as time has progressed younger women have become more aware of these and they have documented that in lilavati's daughters i think that part of lilavati's daughters has not been completely that aspect has not yet been completely appreciated but the book has become immensely popular and i got the sort of the final receipt was that it was mentioned in kaun banega karodpati it was a question whether dilavati's daughters is a collection of stories of 100 scientists 100 women scientists 100 uh, i think women engineers and 100 women poets and the woman actually correctly uh, said it is 100 women scientists and this was a question for 50 but half a crore so i think that told you that it has reached the minds of people and that was the purpose so i think lilavati's daughters has served its purpose we are trying to bring out some few translations as much as possible because i still think that uh, india is many countries in one and english reaches only so far uh, but uh, now i come to more specific answer to the question you asked rohit about the fact that we are only 13% in research women in science in fact in india we don't have any problem on women in education meaning there are enough girl students i think you people will agree mm. you have seen as many girls as many boys in your schools up to your msc i'm very sure even in engineering these days that's the case that was not the case always but even in engineering now that is the case so the fraction among students of women is high in fact all india's education surveys of last 10 years now are available and you see that the fraction of women among students is uh, quite high especially at least in the non rural urban areas uh, uh, it is high among teachers also it is high if you think back your teachers from your school days to teachers up to college you will find the fraction of women among teachers is also where we really lack is women doing research and all the efforts that we have so far government efforts schemes have been only to attract more women to edu- in science stem education have been for women who have left science career after a phd to come back to a career which is good these are helpful these are necessary but i think they are not sufficient we still have to appreciate why we have a small number in faculty and active researchers we have to analyze it we have to work actively towards increasing that number and this number doesn't have to be increased by reservation it has to increase organically and my feeling is that if you do your certain processes in selections such that only merit and merit only gets considered and extraneous things such as whether you are married whether you are ready to make a move and offered a job you know if, if these things are not put in the equation things will change but that needs to be done and i think in india we still need to evolve what i call you know mentorship programs for young women scientists how to conduct 
because you know we have in india programs to help women come back to a different career to retool themselves but nobody thinks that women may not want to retool themselves after having spent 10 years in doing a phd and how can we make sure that if there are these bumps in the beginning of the career where you have to handle the biological clock and the scientific clock how to help them along? And there is this very famous, uh, whom I like very much, uh, Professor Sulochana Gargi, one of the pioneering uh, scientists, uh, theoretical mathematician and uh, climatologist, uh, monsoon expert of India, in who worked in India Institute of Science. She had said 25 years ago to me, Rohini, just tell them to help us along in the first five years when we are having children. After that, we don't need any special treatment. Uh, today she is maybe you know 75 or I don't know how old she is. She's a little sen more senior to me, so close to 80, maybe. But this puts it in the nutshell. That we need to appreciate that women the need is not only to help them come back, the need is that they need not have to leave. And the speed breakers, you can all slow down a little bit on the speed breaker. So in the STIP 2020, actually, we have given some suggestions. We have given some good suggestions how you can have more women in the selection bodies, how you can consider scientific age as opposed to biological age, how you can take into account breaks. So that, you know, instead of creating the women in science program of Department of Science and Technology is like creating super numerary soft money positions. So you get, you are, you are, allowed to continue your research but mm -hmm. then you are not part of the mainstream you are a soft money position you are not directing you are not visualizing your your vision is not part of the progress of the institution so how you can be avoid the need of taking a break because as a scientist taking a break actually makes you obsolete sometimes with the new techniques with the new tools so I think that kind of thing is in India still has to evolve. How you can make gender neutral uh, processes for hiring, for fellowship selections, for uh, you know award selections. How the, can the processes be gender neutral? How can be aware of the underlying uh, biases? And actually in the Western world, at least in Europe, in some parts of US, I've seen people trying to do this. You know, there are studies, social science studies, which have analyzed it. And then sort of, you know, you inform the selection committee members beforehand that this is what research has proved. So you make sure that you don't suffer. Your selection doesn't suffer from these pitfalls. So I think the need of this awareness is something important. And in the UK, there is a very important charter that is called... Uh, Athena Swan. And in India, based on that uh, Department of Science and Technology is trying to establish something called GATI, Gender Advancement Transforming Initiatives. Uh, it's still early days and I don't know where it goes, but that is again, Rohit, to your concrete answer to your question, what are the solutions? So I think right now we are still bordering on the solutions which are which are important, which are necessary, like the Mentorship programs like role model programs, supernumerary positions to increase the women students when they are short in number. But I think now the majors in uh, India have to go to the next level. They have to think about how in the progress path of a woman scientist, the obstacles which are coming, which are hidden obstacles, how can one address them? And not just, you know, I mean, we have DST as a program, training women for leadership. As though, you know, there is this mistaken thing, I feel, that women cannot lead. So we have to train them to lead. I mean, do we train men for leadership? Train everybody for leadership. They have no problems. But why do you have to train only women for leadership? So the blame that women are not in leadership position is put on women. By saying that you lack something that doesn't mm -hmm. make you natural. That may well be, but I don't think in India we have made any uh, studies which prove this conclusively. Mm -hmm. So the need of such studies is there. So there is a lot that needs to be done. 
but I'm at least glad that this discourse has become a part of psych, a general psych. And that is important. Mm -hmm. And what is important, which is not yet necessarily understood, is that getting more women in science is not just for women. It's for science. And there are actually now proofs from social science studies in the West that diversity in the workforce actually can add to the quality and the multidimensionality of the research ecospace. So that is my long answer, but I still think short enough to cover both the points that uh, Rohit, you had asked. You make some very valid points about uh, leadership with women. There, if there have been several instances where they take charge, uh, women in general take charge of situations. So you're very right. If they're in instituting programs, it should be for everyone in general. And this, your, an your answer actually kind of is the right segue to our next question, which is that the scientific uh, ecosystem in India has changed a lot since when you started. What do you think are some of the challenges that still exist now? And uh, what are some of the policies that you would uh, say need to be implemented for that? Okay, that's a very good question. And actually, I will, with a few respects, I'm actually going to read out a few lines from an article I wrote to Hindustan Times, which appeared on 17th January. And the title is, and that will give the answer, essentially gives you the answer in one line. I have said science in India needs a ground up approach. So let me say in my mind, uh, you know, science in India is looking up. Let me say I am very proud to be part of Indian science ecosystem. We are a much bigger part than we were when I came back to India. Whether we are more important than uh, pre-independence times, I doubt because pre-independence times we can boast of very many towering scientists. And now we can even now we can, at least I can talk in the subject I know that is theoretical physics. I can count on the fingers of two hands, you know, people like Ashok Sen and people like uh, my friend uh, Deepak Dhar or, you know, who are towering theoretical uh, scientists and who have made contributions that have opened up new areas of investigation in theoretical science. But by and large, we have developed into a good professional group of scientists. So, but I think we, again, just like I said, for women in science efforts, we need to go to the next level. We cannot be satisfied that we are now considered good professional scientists. We have to ask the question, what happened to the glory we had when we had a Raman and when we had a Bose and when we had a Jagdish Chandra Basu and, you know, uh, we had uh, all the great stalwarts like uh, Mahalanabis, uh, or uh, uh, Baba or you know, and the whole lot. So where do we go? And I think if I have to ask this question, I would say that there are, it's a five point uh, uh, solution, uh, five, five issues. So let me try to read it out essentially, if I can, uh, one second. Uh, you have to bear with me for a minute. Uh, yeah. So I would say there are five heads. One is that we have to have more people doing science. Per million in India, over the years, you know, we look at it, we have, you know, something like it has been uh, over the years, about 100 to 200 people per million who are involved in science. Our closest competitor, let's say China, which, has, which began from similar con ground conditions as basic conditions as we had, around the same time. In 1996, China had about 436 per million and today they have 1600 per million. So just sheer increase in the number of people who do science. Our highly trained scientific uh, uh, student population is not entering scientific research. That's the first thing. Then the second important thing is so attracting people to do science, okay, and increasing that number. But I would say that the second equally important thing is to increase the uh, diversity of the ecosystem. 
making the scientific ecosystem more diverse and more equitable. Not just that, but ensuring academic freedom. Understanding the importance of basic science research, the blue sky research, as much as the innovative directed mission research. And then developing realistic expectations from scientists. What scientists can do to solve the problems of India and maybe later on the problems of the world and creating what I called a ground up approach. These are the five heads under which I think we need to make progress. And I think the academic freedom kind of, you know, the first increasing numbers, I think you will agree that we have to somehow have some systematic efforts in increasing the numbers because you have to have enough people contributing so that you can, you know, by law of averages, something really worthwhile and something really good comes out. But the second equally important is that I think we as the ecosystem, we as the scientists have to learn not to be satisfied only by making small contributions. We need to think out of the box. We need to see whether we can do some, you know, we need to increase our aims. We need to raise our aims where we can go. We are happy making very important contributions which raise the path of science. But we need to somewhere see whether we can charter new paths. And that requires sometimes taking risks. And actually compared to the rest of the world in India, our educational system, our research institutions, our jobs are much more protected. In the US, you don't continue, even you know, getting tenure itself becomes a difficulty. And your progress can, you know, your personal progress can severely be hindered if you have not uh, published and if you have not worked on things that are the uh, focus areas, etc. But in, the, in India, in our major research institutes, in fact, I think we are much more blessed. And we need to, I think our young researchers need to sometimes focus on research areas which may take time to get the answers, but ask somewhat deeper questions and not just ask quick questions which can give quick answers and which can give you glory. That can, of course, the temptation is high. Citation indices grow very fast when you uh, do a small bit of piece of work in a fashionable area rather than, uh, you know, an area where it takes four years to do a fundamental experiment, very deep experiment. And perhaps the experiment may be not accepted easily. But I think some of us have to dare to do that, the younger people. And that would be, you know, one of the, that's what, and, and that freedom, that academic freedom, our institutions should give us. I think it existed much more, if you ask me, in the early parts of the Indian uh, scientific uh, society. Now, somehow, I'm sorry to say this, but we are being moving on a path too much on the innovation path, not realizing that an investment in basic science is essential before we do innovation-based research. I mean, even for COVID-19, our people have been able to do these fantastic contributions because before COVID-19, for years together, they were studying some things. They were studying coronaviruses. And very often, many of the systems that were developed specially for COVID-19 were actually being developed for doing something else, which people were interested in understanding. So I think this balance, and that is where I think our policymakers have to realize that balance between basic science research and the innovation-based applied research has to be maintained. It is, it are two wheels of the progress. And you can neglect either of them at your own peril. You can not make your institutions ivory towers which think only about basic research problems, but you also cannot make them only the mission mode, uh, based research. 
both have to exist. And how do we make sure both exist? How do we make sure, you know, so when we decide what are our thrust areas, these, these decisions, of course, would be taken at the end of the day by the hand that feeds. So since most of the research in India still gets supported by state, the state will have say into what areas of science we need research in. And yes, country does need, you know, people like Mahalanobis, for example, when they said a growing India needed research in economical sciences, which will help the development. Sure enough, ISI developed different working groups with different departments, which looked at that. So sure enough, we have done that in the past. The scientists have done that in the past. But this decision about which areas are we best trained to focus on or where we can expect to make some breakthroughs. I think these decisions and which something which will bring some rewards and also which in terms of international research will place us, India, at uh, the in the top group. How does that work? How do we decide that? And I think I like the method in the US for that. Very often in the US, there are ground-based approaches. The communities come together. Every 10 years, different communities bring out a white paper. And it's a well-researched white paper. It's not a report written by uh, five people, you know, uh, sitting in their offices and picking up different reports from them. There are meetings, there are presentations, there is hard work, research, which people present to each other. The, and, and through that, which is the path to go forward, they identify. I mean, I'm in, I am familiar with the effort in the US because I was a member of the High Energy Physics uh, Advisory Panel of the US for the DOE and NSF. And I have seen the kind of effort that the agencies put together the funds they give for such an effort to, but more than the funds, it's also the scientists themselves who put in enormous amount of effort. It's a year long exercise and the astronomers have done that, astrophysicists have done that, nuclear physicists have done that, particle physicists have done that, material scientists have done that. And that has decided the progress that the, you know, past that the country has actually taken, the funding agencies have actually followed. And I think in India, we, time has come where we need to have such a ground, ground up approach. So I think Rohit and you, I have tried to give you an, a very sort of somewhat comprehensive answer for the different aspects of the questions that you were asking as to what do we need to do, I feel, to go ahead in the world of uh, research and what policy changes do we really need to bring about. Now, the right. one quick thing that I have not addressed till now is the funding. Just because the state gives the funding and that, that is the, I, as I said, the academic freedom. That just because the state gives the funding, I don't think that uh, it uh, needs to direct what areas of research you could focus on. I mean, I get very disturbed, frankly, with the young researchers, both in the US and in India, in fact, where they, when they say, oh, I'm not working, I have stopped working in this area because there are no grants in this area. Okay, and I mean, it can apply to area research areas where you need expensive equipments or, you know, but it's not always the case. It's all, also the case of what brings more laurel. I mean, I can understand a young researcher wants to progress fast, move fast, and in this world says, okay, I need to publish glamorous things. I need to have a paper in nature uh, physics, if nothing else. I need to have a, you know, that, that's true. But somewhere along the path, a little further along the path, you need to think of asking questions which you can sink your teeth in. And you should have the freedom to do that. And I think in India right now, the way things are, that freedom is still there. But we need to make sure that it is maintained. That's very important. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that uh, wonderful answer. I have so many questions. Uh, like, uh, I wish for every point. Uh, first of all, I uh, will make sure to share the Hindustan Times article with our uh, viewers. 
and uh, for every point i can have a long discussion uh, with you but uh, uh, unfortunately time won't permit but perhaps in a future blog uh, uh, at least in a written blog i'll try to uh, we'll try to include uh, something like that no but uh, i but... think i have in fact from what i can see your questions you had asked this particular mm -hmm. dial answer has covered most of the issues at least i have touched mm -hmm. upon almost all the issues that you wanted to right Yeah. No, like Maybe individual... one part, point I should yeah. say about particle physics being collaborative resource, which you said, mm -hmm. you know, heavy field, not just particle physics, actually astronomy, astrophysics also is a collaborative and and even genome yeah, sequencing. I, was... I mean, all these are resource heavy fields. Yeah. Uh, and I think in this collaboration among governments is also very, very important. And mm -hmm. we have, you know, our scientists have made important contributions such that we have participated in these mega projects. but now to continue our participation in these mega projects there are two things that we have to bring to the um, how should i say to bring to the uh, table and that is some money but i think that is the extra funding that i am talking about which china has brought to bear which we have not yet i believe okay mm -hmm. and second and that it is not not demeaning to participate in international projects you can make fundamental original contributions and get the credit for those contributions is something that we have to appreciate and we have to t teach our governments this that's right. also important we have to convince them of this not just teach we have to convince them of this i mean yeah. i'll give an example the, the data acquisition system that was built by the pune you know, near pune there is gmrt Mm -hmm. and now there is a big uh, square kilometer array that is being developed in uh, south africa and in fact what was developed for gmrt the brain of the telescope is actually what indians are contributing in uh, uh, the square kilometer array but for right. us to be able to do that we have to also bring in money to the table days are long past when people will say that you indians your contributions are so good just come and help us you know we have to because we are becoming a big player we have to also pitch in and we have to decide i mean the money is limited it's not a limitless money that that's where i said ground based approach where scientists together can evaluate where we are going to make the most impact and that's why i went by ground based approach and that was your question so this scientific diplomacy science diplomacy mm -hmm. is a complicated story is governments scientists and you know that's because very often the participation in mega projects in india has begun by interaction among scientists their overwhelmingly good contributions but now again that too also has to be more organized and has to be taken to the next level and some dialogues and processes more importantly are required and i think in the us these processes are put in in very good place a very good way but we need to think about those processes yeah i think one of the ligo observatory being built in india as part of the triangulation uh, array yes. i think that's yes. one good example uh, in Correct. the near future very and good. yeah uh, it, yeah especially given that all these fields are such uh such uh, uh like uh, instrument heavy uh, for the experimental side uh, i think it will be very important to uh, actually i would like to take a minute if you allow me to also talk yeah, about yeah. a tragedy in the indian science and that is the ino yeah <laughs> indian neutrino observatory yes even the money has been sanctioned yes but the politicians the politics and the polity together have hindered the lab being laid down anywhere and this is a 10 to 12 year hard breaking story mm -hmm. even the money within was sent yeah and within which uh, that window of time which was essential yeah and within so that time a uh, sad story yeah within that time uh, uh, in japan they could already uh, build china. a solar neutrino ah uh, yeah china china So they China could already build the solar neutrino. China yeah. is building, and it, they they will start taking data in twenty twenty three. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, that's a bit. Yeah, that's a tragedy. That's a sad But, part, uh, actually. Yeah, yeah. So no, so uh, yeah, just just 
just to finish up this uh, this part of the conversation very quickly uh, where do you think are the uh, where where do you think is the overall particle physics field uh, going uh, and in the near future what are the things that are waiting to be discovered around the corner okay so i have to get my crystal ball out <laughs> <laughs> no jokes apart i think particle physics finds itself at a very very funny juncture right now and i will tell you what i mean by that is that the journey that began in 1967 i would say was completed more or less not more or less actually in 2012 with the discovery of the higgs sort of the crowning glory of completion of description of fundamental interactions and fundamental particles in the framework of standard model so you would say fine then you know dusted subject is over uh, but that is not the case and that brings to the second sub part of my working area that you mentioned beyond standard model because even with the greatly successful standard model before it was successfully demonstrated that it is correct in 1970 uh, in 2012 we already knew that this is not the full story and the simple thing is that there are at least while we are able to have answers in terms of the laws of these fundamental particles to understand a qualitative understanding how from the beginning of the universe today we have only matter how galaxies and you know so see cosmologists and astrophysicists have understood slowly how the universe began how galaxies formed how before galaxies how neutrons protons formed which we are but why is it that the world contains only neutrons protons and not anti neutrons and anti protons no matter how far in the universe you go so it's not as though that in the our vicinity there are no anti neutrons no anti protons in equal numbers but actually there are nowhere in the universe so this is a fact in principle we understand how neutrons were created but then the same laws must explain why the anti neutrons which were created vanished and that is called the it goes under the name baryon asymmetry the world contains only matter but not anti matter the universe the world is not universe we don't understand that in terms of laws of standard model of particle physics we understand it to some extent there is a very famous scientist called sakharov which gave the first hints how it could be so that is that means that there is physics beyond standard model outside the laws that we have discovered which are required we don't know what they are but they are required to explain this then there is this famous dark matter its existence is now proved beyond doubt and this was as i said first began completely established first very positively established by experiments by vera rubin at the level of galaxies but now you know it exists at the level of galaxies it levels at, at the level of galaxy structure uh, clusters it exists at the level of the universe that is how we understand how matter how galaxies evolved how stars formed the dark matter was essential for that but what is this dark matter it does not illuminate that means it does not interact with light and in standard model there is only one candidate which does not interact with light and that's a neutrino and we know from the experiments that it cannot be the neutrino which means there is at least one particle beyond the table of fundamental particles the mendeleev's table of particle physics you know the periodic table of particle physics needs to have more entries so there is physics beyond standard model then there is more esoteric questions which tell me that there is physics beyond standard model and that has to do with the fact that the higgs boson that was found in 2012 has a mass which is very comparable to the masses of the w and the z bosons which are carriers of the electroweak interactions electromagnetic and weak interactions so when it all happens when you say okay so before even the higgs boson was found we knew that the higgs boson will confirm standard model but we knew there is physics beyond standard so simple answer particle physicists would like to understand what this physics beyond standard model is and because it must exist i mean these are observations and 
any theory has to explain observations and these are puzzles. Now, of course, since the problems were known even before 2012, the answers were being proposed in the 30 years before 2012. And supersymmetry happens to be one of the possible answers. But the evidence of supersymmetry is missing right now in the collider experiments. Now, is it missing simply because we don't have enough energy? Is it missing because our ideas are wrong? So the puzzle of the dark matter, the puzzle of the matter-antimatter asymmetry are perhaps the puzzles, like the puzzle why the electron in a Bohr atom doesn't fall inside the nucleus, is a puzzle right now. That puzzle required invention of quantum mechanics. Maybe this puzzle requires inventing something new. We don't know. So that is one very exciting direction of particle physics, but that's also a very obscure direction. We don't know what will happen. But second one, which is important, is quantum gravity. How do I give a quantum description of the very complex phenomenon of gravity? And astrophysicists, astronomers are studying black hole physics in a big way. So therefore, gravitation, theories of gravitation are beginning to, you know, they are being, they, they are, hard questions are being asked of these theories. And so far, classical theory of gravity tends to hold its own very fundamentally, you know. The only the general theory of relativity is required, but otherwise we are fine. But therefore, this is one very obvious area. And one of the ways, you know, there are two, three different ways of addressing quantum theory of gravity. One is loop gravity, one is string theory. Then the techniques of string theory, which is a very mathematical subject, is actually feeding back into the more classical particle physics in terms of adding additional computational techniques to our arsenal. Then how to understand what is called strongly interacting systems in so, so there is enough to keep us, ourselves ask very fundamental questions of this nature. How soon they will be answered, one doesn't know. And then there are these experiments, what I call astroparticle physics. Because now the experiments are not only conducted in the colliders, experiments are not only conducted underground in the deep detectors, experiments are also conducted in the sky. We have Hubble telescope, we have now the JWST telescope. And funnily enough, even though these things are st t studying the physics at the beginning of the universe, at distances which correspond to the beginning of the universe, since the laws of particle physics still held good then, through the observations, sometimes we have possibilities of studying unusual aspects possible unusual aspects of the laws of particle physics. So therefore, the future of particle physics is in these theoretical developments, is in these deep underground experiments, is of course in the collider experiments, and equally important, the connection between what happens in the sky, in the universe, and what happens on the ground or underground. That's the future. So I think it's a pretty exciting uh, journey. A difficult journey now compared to last 100 years which was somehow simple. Now that we see what is ahead of us, we realize that last 100 years we were extremely lucky. That we unraveled all the mysteries at the heart of the atom, at the heart of the nucleus, at the heart of the quark. You know? I mean, we were lucky. Our generation of scientists was lucky. Now we have difficult times ahead. But exciting. Perhaps the, I mean, I guess the experiments are now lagging severely behind the theory uh, uh, I think compared I mean, to like previous that, century. If I were to look at it, that's why dark matter is an experimental observation. So ex right. yeah. experiments are posing challenges which we are not able to address. Yeah. Right. But no, in traditional sense, yes, that traditionally for the last 100 years, theorists were making predictions for experimentalists, experiments were confirming them and putting new puzzles. Now we have come to a funny stage, which I described earlier. Okay. Um, so now moving away slightly from particle physics, 
uh, we were wondering what your uh, yeah we were wondering what your philosophy for mentoring your uh, mentoring ah, yes. graduate students and postdocs yeah. is and yeah. whether you had any advice for these two groups as well as the uh, early career researchers who are moving back yeah. to india and starting out their career yeah. as well so let me just uh, i think uh, this is where i perhaps right now you know because th- i find that in these issues there are no uh, simple answers because mentoring is a very subjective process uh, you know phd itself is a advising supervising for a phd is also a very subjective process it changes you know even i how i advise different students would be very different because somebody will not like it very much if i pros- prescribe every step to be taken and somebody actually will not proceed if i don't give every single step to be taken if you ask me the first one method is better because that teaches you more but on the other hand some people do not progress that maybe you know in the process they realize that a career in science is not for them but that is something they have to figure out from themselves so i find it rather hard to answer in a single brush stroke uh, uh, sort of ad- mentoring students but i would say every person has a different uh, need and as a good mentor you ha- and i have seen some really great mentors great supervisors who are able to appreciate what each student needs you know sometimes even giving a problem to a student you give one kind of problem because that fascinates you and that has happened to me and then the student is simply it simply does not grab him or her and you know they actually one one with one student i had said to him that the amount of time you spent arguing with me why this cannot be done you could have finished it and you know that, and then one student was not convinced for two and a half years that what i was telling him to do was important and suddenly one morning he read an article and then he said yes now i understand why you are asking me to do this now i don't know how to you know i perhaps i was not i'm not very good at that and some people i know are very good at that is choosing your question tailoring it to the interest i have been able to tailor my questions that i give them from what i can see as their obvious uh, high points in their abilities but how to develop make students develop interest uh, in an area and convince them that this is a important area of intellectual engagement always remains a challenge i feel so that that is the biggest challenge in uh, mentoring but what i prefer normally to do is i try to teach them to be independent and think for themselves i like to leave them be for a while i don't like very much test you know checking every third third day particularly again because i'm a theorist i think if you are in a lab you might want to follow up on a very direct everyday basis what is the result of this experiment what is the result of that measurement but when you are uh, directing over theory then perhaps you know the more less frequent meetings but understanding or directing towards the right methodology and letting them stumble through uh, struggle through because then people take ownership for that work so i think mentoring them to be independent researchers and mentoring them to understand the process of research and the process of science is what i consider more important than teaching them how to solve a particular problem i mean that has a disadvantage in the sense that sometimes i can't give really the cutting edge projects which i want to be finished fast i can't deal with them with my students because they would take time and stumble so i do end up doing that work with some more senior collaborators you know where our we are on the correct wavelength and we we know we can proceed fast so this has you know it depends on if i have a creative and fast young student then sometimes i get that work done with a collaborating student so it changes i mean sometimes some of my work that i'm really happy about came up with a student because that student was very fast 
he was capable of doing a lot of things independently. And at the same time, we were asking questions which were very relevant. So it depends. I mean, but uh, I have had the important component I have always felt is that they have to be independent. And I think that's an important thing. And one thing I try to develop, and I think we have to do, particularly for postdocs, that you have to learn to think independently. You know, as a student, yes, you are following on a project which somebody gave you. And you were told, you know, you were helped along what steps you should take to solve that problem. But thinking more and more independently is quite important. So as a postdoc, that is something we have to do. And I think the most, at least I have found in my life, the most important thing in that is to listen to seminars, listen to talks, and try to understand things when the talks are being presented to you. Ask questions, and not questions to show off how much you know of a subject, but ask questions because you really want to understand what the person is putting across. And I have seen some of our students, perhaps not somebody whom we consider the brightest student, but doing a reasonable PhD. I found they really came into their own as time progressed when they started asking questions. And that's when, so that developing that attitude, and this is something I think I learned as a graduate student, when I still remember Professor C. N. Yang, who was the head of the group and who was the Nobel Prize winner, he told us, Come to a seminar even if you don't understand anything. In the beginning, you will not understand anything. You are just a graduate student who doesn't know the field. But slowly, you will learn to understand. So learning from the seminars is actually for me, learning from the experts. So you have to have exposure to, you have to be lucky in a place where there are good seminars. But seminars, talks, Learning outside your narrow area, narrow subfield, I think is very important because it is by making connections to the ideas in the other areas that sometimes you get very important directions of research in your own sub area. So don't always focus on, don't be too specialized. Don't focus very strongly on a sub area. Try to keep a broader outlook. Try to understand things in a broader range. And say, oh, that doesn't concern me. Shouldn't do that. But that is another important message, if you wish, that I would like to give to students and postdocs. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Godbole, for uh, uh, bearing with us, answering all of our questions uh, so nicely and uh your answers uh, really made us uh, think and i'm sure will uh, make our uh, viewers think as well uh you also made us appreciate particle physics uh, even if we uh, do not have a strong background in particle physics but at least we appreciate what the field is about and uh, what are the uh, what are the uh, beauties of uh, 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 what are the beautiful experiences you can uh, get by working in this field as well as what are some exciting possibilities that the uh, field is going to have? And you also uh, told us about a serious topic about uh, 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 increasing women participation in science. Um, and uh, we'll be sharing the books that you mentioned, uh, the links to the books that you mentioned, including your own book and uh, the book from uh, uh, NCPS, uh, the two authors from NCPS, as well as the Royal Society uh, with our viewers. and. Uh, uh, we'll also share your article on Hindustan Times, uh, article in Hindustan Times, talking about uh, general uh, perspective on <clears throat> science in India. And uh, that should be very informative uh, for our viewers as well. And uh, yeah, with that, uh, I would like to thank you once again uh, for this long but very, very informative interview. We really enjoyed it. And uh, thank you so much. <laughs>